All right. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Serious Angler podcast, episode number 230. As always, I'm your host, Bailey Eichbrett, and joined with me is the captain, Mr. Andy Full. What's going what on? Up? Not a whole lot. It's kind of weird looking at you right now with the barren wall yeah. behind you. I'm like, it's just Bailey's head. There's nothing there. <laughs> There's nothing cool. You're stuck it, looking at my face tonight. Yeah, it's thrown me <laughs> off a little. Like, it sucks for everybody who has to watch on the YouTube side. Oh, poor people. Uh, but yeah, dude, it's it's weird for me. Like, my room's empty. Um, obviously, I mean, I've only been in this house for two years. It's actually, my parents' new house they got a while ago. Um, but like. We're moving. I'm like officially moving my own place. Fiance and I are moving to Buffalo, 10 minutes from you, and uh, literally moving tomorrow. All that's left right now is my desk and this laptop to grind out this podcast with Mr. West Logan. And then I'm putting this thing in the backpack. And tomorrow I'm headed to the fiance's place to help her pack because, good gosh, I don't even know how many cars we're going to need for her crap. All and, of them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, all of the vehicles in the area <laughs> within the zip code we're going to need just to bring her clothes. Oh, God. And we'll have to expand on whatever Best else. Best of luck. No, it, it should be good. We're uh, we're moving in Saturday morning. I'm going to go early. Um, of course, me being me, all fishing stuff is going first. So we're going to go unload. I got, I got a garage. Literally just all going to be fishing stuff, put my kayak in there, all that jazz. So we're going to do that Saturday morning, then Saturday all day. It's just literally going to be getting everything into the apartment and then Saturday, Sunday, breaking down everything, getting all ready to go. And then Monday at 6 a.m., I got a flight out of Buffalo to go to North Dakota because I got a uh, Berkeley, Abu, Fenwick media trip to uh, Grand Forks over at Devil's Lake for it. It's kind of like a walleye deal. So Have that'll fun. be kind of something I'm not kind of used to is the whole walleye deal. So it'll like, be interesting to see uh, what goes on there. And I'll obviously report back next week. But what's going on with you, man? Um, for everybody listening, today is my last day working at the bank, transitioning into full-time guide, so pretty excited about that. So book some trips. Let's go catch some giant smallmouth. So, so if you're listening to this and you have <laughs> Andrew on social or his number, text him and say it's about goddamn time he left yeah. that. Bank. Yeah, it's, it's been a work in progress and just <laughs> had to have the timing right. And going in the fall, I think it's a good time. So wife is on yeah, board. Yeah. We're doing it. Yeah, as long as the wife is happy, you're good. That's all. Yeah, I'm sure I'm going to have a honey-do list about this long every day to take care of. But, hey. You got all the time in the world now. If I can go fishing, like, I already have it set up. So Saturday is a birthday party, so tomorrow. Sunday, guide trip. Monday, fishing with Jeff, guide trip or fishing or landscaping, whatever we decide to do. And then Tuesday is another guide trip. Wednesday through Sunday, I'll be in the Thousand Islands on a family vacation. So you are bringing the boat, correct? I don't think so. What the heck, dude? I last time I took it up there, I, you look down there. So, <laughs> yeah, like, you're crazy. So, <laughs> the last time I took the boat up there, I got to fish for three and a half hours, and we were there for six days. That's all you need for 25 pounds. True, but you don't even need, just, you don't even need a three hours. <laughs> Nowhere to plug it in. Like there's no electrical outlets on the campground. It's just here's what you do you charge your boat it's fully charged when you go up there i send you a couple <laughs> waypoints so you don't even need to go look for them i guarantee they're there oh i i'm sure i can find them so like i'm not too worried about that <laughs> but yeah it's just eh. i'll i'll probably decide on wednesday if i'm taking it or not i'm gonna convince you probably not I'm gonna try my darn <laughs> like <laughs> so I, mean, I, I know a couple people that'll be up there with their boat. So if I really want to go fishing, I can probably just hop on their boat. All right. I'm taking your boat then while you're gone. Okay. Good luck. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trailer it with my Nissan Ultima. Yes. Good luck getting it out of the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> I'll walk the damn thing to the ramp. You'll be in North Dakota. <laughs> oh, you're going next week? Yeah, Wednesday. Oh, I thought it was like two Wednesdays from now. No. And then um, I come back on Sunday and I'm home for, we're home for nine days and then and then I go to North Carolina for six or seven days. So two vacations right in a row. This is pretty nice you're way to start self-employment. You're going to bring the boat and go fish Jordan, right? right? Now, Jordan's actually like four and a half hours from where I'll be. Yeah, that's light work. You can do yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, it's great. I'll be there Dude. for a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> really fast, because obviously we want to get Wes on here uh, to talk with him. But uh, I snuck out for a few hours to go fish with Destin the other day. And... Uh, 
that was one thing we were talking about is like when you're on the road for so long, like you look at three, four hours, even five hour trips, and you're like, yeah, that's nothing. Like that's close. Like after you do like 20 hour drives, I'm sure Wes, like him driving to New York, he can relate. He's three, four hours. All right, that's fine. I could do that. <laughs> You'll get there someday, Andy. We'll get yeah, you there. Yeah, sure. I, I don't mind driving, but I hate driving all at the same time. So I like the first quarter. Like if you're going on a 20 hour drive, the first three, four hours, you're like jacked up and you're like, yeah, I can't wait, can't wait to get there. Then the rest of it absolutely sucks. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, dude, I think without further ado, we should bring him on here. Uh, Mr. Wes Logan. What's going on, dude? What's up, guys? How are y'all? Good. Good. How are you? How we here? We are here. We are here. It's uh I'm trying to how long ago was it? it was, was it before the season the last time we had you on? Uh yeah, I think so. I think it was actually. Or it was yeah, it was right before this year. Why does it feel like it was only two months ago? Did we just have seen you a bunch since then? Maybe that's why. Did uh sorry, I had to I'm trying to think of when it was. I think it was right at the beginning, like right after St. John's. Was I was I oh, on here? No, oh, it was uh, last for the win? Year. Or was it last year? After Neely? No, no, I don't think we got you. We don't I don't think we got you on after nope. Neely. I think we got you on right before you won. I think it was I think it was before. I don't think it was after. Let me yes. look up the date here while I'm sitting here. <laughs> this is going to bug me. Now. We're all just sitting here oh, like, oh. No. Honestly, I think it was in the fall we had you Was on. it that long ago? Yeah, because you had people on your boat and guys were throwing frogs around, if I remember correctly. Was that – am I right on that? that no, my, that was Kyle that Welter. Wasn't me. Kyle, Kyle Welter. Got it. I'm of course Kyle's throwing people. a frog somewhere. <laughs> he's just chilling. He's like guiding these guys while they're fishing around. He's just <laughs> in his seat like – That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying He's to like, hold on, I gotta move to the next spot. Oh gosh. <laughs> I love uh, Kyle. He's awesome. Too many, too many people to remember these days. Where the heck is this thing? Did we all dream this and it never even really happened? <laughs> I got one. Is this the third time or the second time we got you on? It's gotta be I think it's the third, right? Is it the third? I thought it was only two. Is it if it's the second time, then we haven't had you on since October nineteenth. That was in the fall. So that was like, was it your last event? Was it over by then? No. Fort no, was no. Right? Fort no. was at the end of October, right? It, Fort was no, like Fort was November. November. Oh, wow. Because that wasn't even the end of the season. Yeah. We had one more to go. And I was like on the line for the class. Yeah, we won't bring that one up. Ah, hell, that's <laughs> what it is. I'm just <laughs> I'm just glad it wasn't that close this year. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, speaking of that, dude, obviously, congrats on that. That's going to be your first one, right? Yep, yep, for sure. Congrats, buddy. I'm looking forward to, to rooting for you next yeah, year. Yeah, it'll, it'll be a good tournament. Uh, I've never actually been to Hartwell, but, I mean, I know it's slap full of them, and our guys can catch them. So, put two and two together, it makes for a good derby. Absolutely. You got uh, a scary – yeah, you're going up against some scary competition, especially a guy with his home turf looking at a three-peat. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No doubt. <laughs> no but doubt. Dude, so obviously, damn, October, I feel like it's been closer than that. It's probably just because I've seen you want the Classic, then saw you at ICAST. ICAST. Yeah, that's probably why it's all just meshing together. But, um, Bailey's dude, becoming obviously... well-traveled. <laughs> <laughs> Crying, I guess. Uh but, dude, so you made the Classic this year. We haven't had it. It's our first time to really kind of break things down on, on your season. So uh, kind of walk us through, I guess, obviously, not going to go full detail in every single tournament. Yeah. Because, um, obviously, you know, for folks who are listening, they know you obviously won Neely Henry. And every show is po- and possible has gotten you on to talk about Neely Henry, except for us. Uh, <laughs> um, but, uh Talk us through the season, dude. Like mindset going into the first couple events and then kind of trying to stay in position to make the classic throughout the rest. Yeah, uh, I don't know. It kind of started off, you know, we started at the St. John's again like we had the the year before and the year before that. And And every year. Yeah, I wasn't going to say it, but I think this year we're going to be like on seven years straight or something. So, I mean. I don't know. I mean, you kind of know what to expect. You know what we're going into. We're going to be there on a on a new moon. There's going to be a, it's going to be a sight fishing tournament. Blah 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 blah. Uh, I kind of made a gamble 
um, and went to a kind of a, a place where I didn't want to sight fish and I was just going to try and fish and catch them. And I kind of figured them out throughout the tournament, ended up having a good finish there. Uh, caught like, like a eight and a half pounder on second on day two, which like pretty much made the tournament. And I don't know what happened when I caught that fish. Dude, I caught it. Um, I had I, I had to leave like within ten minutes, and I caught it like with like eight minutes to go. I called, and I like freaked out like and didn't realize I had like eight or nine like you know five more minutes to fish because it was three minutes where I had to go basically. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I called it real fit with like eight minutes before I had to be back. And I like just freaked out, put in live well caught, and ran back to the boat ramp. And I'm sitting there like five minutes left, and I'm like, damn, I could have fished some more. But anyway, oh, that? <laughs> yeah, like I'm just you know, sitting there, I'm like, shit, I come in early. <laughs> like, They're like, what's this kind of bag, yeah. bro? <laughs> like, I'm freaking, like, I'm shaking, I'm freaking out. I'm like, dude, I called like a pound and a half or with an eight and a half. I was like, oh my God. Anyway, like when I called it, like, it, like, I don't know what happened. But, like, in my mind was like, all right, this year is going to be different than last year because, obviously, last year I barely missed the Classic. I had a lot of missed opportunities. Like, every big fish I hooked freaking come off. And, like, to catch that one, it kind of like – I don't know if it gave me a lot of confidence or what, but then I fished real good the rest of that tournament. Then I stumbled at uh, Knoxville, which sucked. That place is awful. I hate it. I think everyone stumbled. God, <laughs> I mean, I mean top 40. just terrible. Um, but then we went to Pickwick, and I caught a bunch of breaks. Uh, you know, stuff just was rolling real good. I made some good decisions. Uh, we left there and went to where we go at Pickwick. Sabine mm -hmm. lost a bunch of fish at Sabine, and I kind of was worried I was going to get back in that mental place that I was at my rookie year, like just the pissed off, mad at everything, nothing ever goes right. Then got to Fork, caught a couple good breaks in that tournament, got the momentum back going, rolled to Neely. You know, a lot of stuff happened there. Good Lord was looking out for me. Won that one. Carried that momentum to Gunnersville. Almost won that one if Cup Paul hadn't have caught 47 pounds on day one. <laughs> um, left from there, and then we headed up north, which I freaking hate. But I put myself in such a good position in the points that I knew I didn't have to, like, top 10 or, or top 20. I just needed to, like, catch some. And, you know, top 50, both of those, or, you know, mid-50s on both of them. And I mean, it wasn't all in all – great year but you know i mean the the high fin my my bad finishes weren't near as bad as they were in my rookie year and my good finishes were obviously a lot better so i mean that that's kind of the whole difference and the the crazy thing about the elite series is that's that's two or three decisions and two or three fish getting in the boat that didn't get in the boat last year like that's how close it is with these guys like you can't mess up any at like at all mm -hmm. yeah i mean dude i mean your worst finish was a 65, and then obviously Tennessee River was 59. Mm -hmm. You really, like, you didn't come close to that, really. I mean, obviously, you take that back. You had Champlain and St. Lawrence River. But beyond that, everything yeah. else was yeah. top 30 and above. Yeah. So that's that's pretty consistent. You can't – I mean, you made the Classic, and you got a blue trophy. And I won. And a check. I mean, yeah. I'd say it's a pretty dang good season there. No, it, it was it was good, but I mean, there's obviously a lot of room for improvement. Um, you know, yeah. you're back. If you ever want to have a run at that, you know, being angler of the year, you know, having a year like Seth did this year, your bad tournaments have to be those mid twenties to thirties. Like you yeah. can't you can't have you can't have those fifties unless you you know you top ten four of them or something like that, which is you know it happens, but you know not all the time. That's that's a lot harder to do than making a thirtieth, in my opinion. Yeah. I agree. And, you know, you know, this next year's schedule kind of bothers me a little bit. You know, we're starting out the same place, but I just don't feel like it sets up as good for me as this year did from a, a shallow water standpoint. Um, we're still going to have some shallow tournaments, but it just the time of years that we were going to be at these places just kind of set up a little bit better. But, you know, I mean, hell, dude, we fished the Elite Series. You got to be able to catch them from January to December, 10 foot, 30 foot, 6 inches. It don't matter. Brown, green, spotted, whatever. Yeah, those those uh, those latter events probably. I mean, obviously Champlain is an exception there, where you can catch them shallow, deep, you know, mm -hmm. high. And then look at Fighter; he caught them literally two feet under the surface in twenty foot of water. Like they're they're yeah. all over the dang place. So like, that's an, Champlain <sighs> is Champlain, but yeah, it, it's a special River, place. Yeah, the St. Lawrence River is something. 
Uh, I'm not, we're not going to get into the St. Lawrence, but into some uh, smallmouth because, dude, when you learn smallmouth, I think that's what's going to be the key factor, that X factor in you being in contention for AOI. You see so many of these Southern guys, right? And this mm-hmm. is no crack at you or any of the other guys from the South. What, you guys are always, you know, there's a, a select individuals that are always in contention from the South until you go to the North and then you see them drop by the top 10. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Because of Northern smallmouth. But uh, and yeah. obviously we're, we're going to get into that in a little bit, but uh, I want to go back on your season this year because obviously one, you got the win and we're going to break apart a key factor of that in a little bit. But uh, I think before we do that, like you mentioned offline here, like Gunnersville, yeah, everyone got whooped up by Kufal, but they they forget that you were literally what thirty yards from Kufal. Yeah, it, it, the same thing. Yeah, ended up being, um, you know, I kind of it, it's it's a it's a real interesting tournament because it kind of developed uh, the way the flipping bite for me developed into the tournament. Um, I was actually catching them on a, a vibrating jig. <laughs> Shut up. Sorry. <laughs> He's talking to us, guys. Don't worry. <laughs> I don't know what she's barking at. Um, But, yeah, like I was catching him on a vibrating jig and on a Shad's phone deal. And, I, like, it's so weird, dude. Like, the way my this way my whole year went. There was a stretch of milf or, like, high drill and milf oil mixed over on the bank, like, close to a high spot. I was catching them, like, on a spook or a top water and a vibrating jig. And in practice, I went over there, and the wind had been blowing into it, so it, like, made a mat of blown-up eelgrass. And I had, like, two bites on a frog the first day of practice. Hush! <laughs> and I go over there the second day of the tournament, and the wind, obviously, has switched directions. There's no more, there's no more like, matted-up stuff. It's all just a little bit under the water. And I'm looking around, and I'm like, I need to, like, flip this. Like, I know there was fish here, but, like, I, did, I could, can't catch them on a frog because there's, like, nothing to throw a frog on. And I'm flipping around like my fifth flip, dude. I flip over there and I'm reeling it up. Like I get hung up on the whatever milk I don't even remember what piece of grass it was. And it comes loose and I'm like reeling in it and a shadow comes up under it. And like I just, for some reason, I just click my bail and it goes down and it, like my line jumps. I set the hook and it's a five pounder. And I'm like, <laughs> all right. Like Cole's like a pound and a half. I'm like, okay, I'm going to flip the rest of the day. So that's where the flipping deal kind of come in. But I saw the area that actually me and Caleb ended up catching some in, on day three and day four. There was a lot of brim beds on the back side of that island. And, dude, in the second day of practice, I went down to there, and I swear to God, I saw 40 pounds on a brim bed just, like, just sitting around. It. Like, five-pounder, six-pounder, two sixes, a four. Like, they were just everywhere. And I'm like, dude, if they ever decide to leave those brim beds, like, they're going right there to them mats. Like, that, every fish in here, because they can't – they're not going to go to the river. Like, because they'll have to swim, obviously, all the way around the island. I mean, they're just – those fish live shallow. That's that's where they're going to go. And, it, dude, he just went to it on day two. And I never got up there to that by day two because I already had 20 pounds. By the time, like, I left that little area where I'd caught them, like, the flipping stretch beside the vibrating jig place. So I never went up there. Day three, I did the same thing, and I didn't have enough – I didn't. I think I only had 15 or 16 pounds. And I ran up there to just check it. And, like, I see a boat up there by the bridge, and I start flipping on the bottom side of it and catch a four and a half and then catch a five. And I'm like, I'm going to leave it. And as I go to leave, like, I see, he turns, and I see it's him, and I'm like, oh, my God. Because like, when I caught those two big ones, I was like, well, I'm just going to come sit here day four and just catch up as many as I can, like, just see what happens. I don't know. I ended up leaving it because he was there, and I wasn't going to burn him. I, I mean, I, I got two bites that fast. I didn't know if he had been fishing there a lot or if they were just, like, fresh or whatever. And then me and him talked um, going into day four, and his main area where he would caught the big bag, he thought would have fizzled out, and he thought his best chance to win was in that area. And I thought he, he just – he kind of asked me in a gentleman's agreement. I said, dude, you can have it. I said, if I need a bite by lunch, I'll come up there. I won't get in your way. I said, I just want to try and, you know, stay in second. I don't, I don't want to mess with your mind. I don't want to come in on you. You deserve to win, dude. You've got that big of a lead. Don't don't let me hinder you from doing anything. So, I mean, and like, I think around 11 or 30 or 12, I ran up there and caught three or four because, I mean, I didn't have nothing. Ended up having catching 12 pounds in there. And then I left again. Uh, but just, just a cool way the whole tournament played out. But, I mean, for him to exploit those two areas like he did, like, it was it was definitely his tournament to win. Heck yeah, it was very impressive to see him 
pick that apart. And yeah. then I was also, you look at it on the view, like obviously, and I think there's people who understand it and then there's people that don't. And so for folks who maybe you watch that tournament and you still don't understand this, I think this would be good to kind of break down. That kind of fishery, you guys were maybe what, 80 yards from each other at one point? I'm, I'm going to say that whole entire stretch, like from this, the last grass mount this way, the last grass mount that way, might have been 200 yards. Right. Maybe, maybe, maybe 300 at the most, dude. It was, but now they went, like, there was a bunch of, I say that, but it's not like it was a straight edge, like just a straight mat. Like, there was a bunch of isolated stuff in there. But I mean, for two guys to be in there fishing, you couldn't, if two guys had fished that the entire time, neither one of them would have won. Like, it, it was nowhere near that big. And there wasn't that many fish. There was enough fish, but it wasn't, like, just slap full of them. Yeah. And so so what I was trying to get at, though, is, like, they see you guys in the camp. There's a view of, I think you, you caught, like, a four and a half or a five. Mm -hmm. And you could see Kufal in the mm -hmm. background. And I, I'm sure there's some people, like, oh, why are they so close to each other? Yeah. And like, that's a scenario where it's, like, what you guys exactly were doing, that's, to be honest, that's not even that close. No, it, and, it, and it, it wasn't like, a like oh, we're fishing on top of each other. Like, I had been fishing down this stretch, and he had been coming this way. Like, and we just happened to meet on this one single mat. He was on one side of it, and I was on the other side of it. And, you know, I mean, the mat was, I don't know, five boat lengths wide. I mean, you could, like, if you were going to throw a frog over it, you would, like, throw to the end of it. Like, we, it looks close on the camera, but we were we were in talking. I, we were talking when I caught it. But, I mean, it wasn't like we were just, like, flipping in the same hole. But we just happened to meet right there. And, you know, going back and watching the footage, dude, he caught, like, I caught a four and a half out of that mat. I caught that almost 500 right then. And then I went and watched back him. Dude, that mat, he caught, like, I don't know how many four or 500 out of, like, that same exact mat. I don't know. Just I don't know if there was a brim forward. bed around it or, or if there was a brim bed close or something. Like, they were just, it seemed like every time one of us got a bite in that mat, it was a big one, which yeah, is that, crazy. Incredible. That was awesome to watch. Um, and also just kind of like Kufal has some very interesting, like kind of, I don't want to say interesting, but more like unique mechanics when it comes to mm -hmm. flipping. It's really cool to watch because like, obviously you're on the other side and I believe you weren't even so like, so Kufal switches hands, right? He flips with his right and then reels with his right. Mm -hmm. So he's flipping with his right hand, switching over. Um, like he, I think they said it in, um, was it St. John's? No. Was it Sabine beforehand that he, Sabine, he was on he was on yeah. live a few days? And I believe you're more traditional. Like you were flipping with your left and reeling with the correct, so you didn't have to switch. I did. Yeah, I, and I actually I do both. Like if I'm flipping like mats like that where I'm not having to be precise, most of the time when I'm punching or something, I'll flip left handed and just you know just dropping it around. But if I'm like flipping hard cover, like I want to lay it somewhere, I'll flip right and swap over like he was. But like I just. I don't know with that big rod it's just easy to just kind of drop it around like when you're not having to be like i want to put it like right by that stick or something yeah and but his hook set's cool like crazy like dude yeah. like his little like it's it's pretty cool like honestly he's like a ninja yeah he's quick with it <laughs> he's quick. i don't know i, I get yeah. i get a lot i get a little bit not really a lot of flack but people ask me all the time why i set the hook like in a mat instead of like pulling into him and i mean the like, I, the reason I flip left-handed a lot, too, is I keep my finger on the braid. Like, as I flip, like, mm -hmm. at, like I let it, like, I use a loose pro TI, and the reel is kind of small, so I'm able to keep my finger on the line as it's falling. So, as soon as it goes through, like, I feel and get it. Like, I mean, I I don't know. I just, I don't jerk, like, really hard, but, like, I mean, I let him have it pretty good. You pop it. Yeah. I mean, and it's more, like you're saying, it's more of a pop because... Mm -hmm. When most of the time, if when he gets it, he's either going to take off real fast, like be running, and you got to get on him quick, or he's just going to sit there, and either way, it's going to work out good for you. Like, if it's a really mm -hmm. big one, he's probably just going to be sitting there, and you need to pop him anyway, because, I mean, getting it through a six, seven pounder's mouth is not easy to begin with, especially through a bunch of crap. So, yeah, I mean, that's just that's just my take on it. Yeah, so I kind of want to break this down a little bit here, because I think, I mean, obviously for myself, too, because I don't punch a lot. I don't, like... I'm the absolute there's worst flipping, at it. There's <laughs> flipping grass, but then there's flipping heavy cover mm -hmm. like in terms of milfoil hydrilla where you're essentially punching through that grass. Right. What you guys were doing. Um, so there's, for me, flipping grass, it's completely different. 
and I'm kind of curious if maybe I'm just thinking the wrong way, but like when I'm flipping grass, like whether it was a jig or a Texas rig, I'm going to flip those uh, you know, clumps of milfoil. I'm going to let it hit bottom. I might raise it once or twice, but if not, I'm just going to like, I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to keep flipping. I see here different guys have different theories. So I'm curious your take on it. When you flip into, you know, that milfoil or that hydrilla and you let it fall to the bottom, are you guys like, we'll just raise it right back up. If you don't get bit on the way down, are you one that raises? I saw Hoop fall. He's doing like pops. I don't mm. know if he's like popping his entire line or if he's just popping slack. Like, what are you kind of, what's your process of trying to figure out what they want? I, and I'll go both because in that tournament, I was actually flipping like you're talking about, like the isolated, like just little clumps with a three quarter. And then I would go to the ounce and a quarter with the, the thick stuff. But in the thick stuff, like it kind of depends on, I go by water temperature and weather and like how I feel like they're set up. I had a, a guy that lives around here teach me back when I first started or he actually taught me how to do it like when I was 12 or 13 down at Eufaula. And like he, the colder it is, the fish tend to scent more closer to the mat, obviously. Cause I mean the heat, right. You know, you got heat in the mat, like winter time, they'll be right under the mat. And a lot of times you'll go through it. And if he don't get it, like you can raise it up. I like to raise it up, you know, probably cause if you've ever looked at a, a hyacinth mat of, I don't even know what that grass we were flipping matted up was called, but most of the time the roots fall down, you know, six to eight inches. Most of the time I like to bring my bait up, let it hit the bottom of the mat and drop it down to where I think like he can see it if he's sitting, you know, against those roots. Cause most of the time, if he's not just going to be sitting in a, in no man's land, like he's going to be on the bottom, he's going to be against it, or he's going to be right under the roots where he can kind of see, but still kind of be hidden. In my opinion, I, I'm no expert. Mm -hmm. I mean, dude, I don't know, but I, that's right. just kind of what I do. I don't, a lot of times if they're on the bottom and you're flipping thick mats, like dude, when you drop it down there and it goes all the way down and you pick up and it's welded to the bottom. I mean, that's kind of like an indication, like he either followed it straight down, which it's possible. But most of the time if he's on the bottom and you pick up, like it's went down, it picks up and it's sitting there. Like he's got it. Like that's, he's on the bottom. You just need to go in there. And after you get a bite like that, you go on down, keep flipping. When you, it goes down, you just kind of hop it a little bit like you're talking about instead of like really raising it up way and high. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's just kind of a trial and error. I mean, when you get around a good population of fish, I mean, they let you know kind of how they're setting up. And and the majority of them will be setting up the exact same way in the mat, whether it's the depth from the edge of the mat, if they're on the bottom, if they're up high, if they're, you know, midways, however that goes. But the, the isolated stuff, like the I call it fighter flipping because that's like you always see the clips of Seth flipping it like champagne and stuff like that millfold. It's just kind of like a piece here and a piece there. Like I, I caught some doing that. And what I noticed was, dude, you'd pitch out there and it'd be sinking and he'd like, you'd see your line jump and dude, he'd be 30, 20, 30 feet to the right when he, you set the hook. Like, dude, you have to like get on them. So, I mean, it, that makes me feel like, like you have to work, watch your rate of fall when that kind of stuff's happening, like you don't want to be flipping a half because it's going to be falling too slow. You don't want to ounce in a quarter because it's going to fly by him. But I feel like that's more where they're active, like when they're hitting it like that. And then, you know, I just kind of went what he did or just watching videos from him. Like, dude, he'll let it go to the bottom and just sit there and kind of hop it a little bit and then reel it in. Like that was, that's just how I kind of went about it that way. Knocking the slack. Yeah. Yeah. Just kind of bouncing it in place. Cause I mean, and I hate to say that, but I feel like he's one of the, the best mill full flippers that i've ever seen you know in in oh, our really? day and time and like he's like just always like on live and stuff when you watch him like dude he'll pitch it out there to go down he'll shake it for just a second shake it and then just bring it back up like he don't do a bunch of you know jabbing and yo-yo and stuff like mm -hmm. that so i mean there's a reason he does it that way every single time like he don't just do it just to i'm gonna try it this way this time yeah i mean there's a reason why he's talked okay. about like he's yeah. in you know, he's yeah. in discussion when it's a grass fishery yeah right? like, for sure if they're in the milfoil fighter's gonna be there yeah. like no doubt no doubt but i think you know yourself uh kufal obviously hackney uh you mm -hmm. got matt heron you know those you guys are the names like when it comes to flipping you know whether it's on the bank or it's grass that's where your names are gonna pop yeah. up and like what you did uh, obviously, you know, Neely was a more of a swim jig deal, which we'll break into in a little bit. Uh, but Gunnersville, really, I think if Sabine, if not, not Sabine, if St. John's didn't do it, like, I think you kind of proved yourself there that that's, if it's a flipping deal, you know, West Logan's name is going to be there. Yeah. And I mean, the bad part about it was I should have, and I mean, and whatever, it's not should have, because I mean, I'm glad Frank won the, the Gunnersville tournament from the fall. I mean, I was flipping that's in that one too. Right. And I actually, mm -hmm. 
and I mean, everything happens for a reason. I, me and Frank are like best friends, but I lost like a six or seven pounder on day three or I'd have won that tournament like hands down. But the fact of it is, is I mean, that was, it was a flipping situation and it was totally different than the one from in May. Like it's just, there's always, it just depends on how the grass is set up. Like I went up there, uh, me and Kyle Jesse from Bass went up there like two weeks mm -hmm. ago and the grass just ain't right. It's just not it's not set up right it's not dead it's not growing here it just it, if we had a tournament there right now it would not be a flipping deal like it mm -hmm. just i mean there'd be a few places some guys would catch them but for like dominating not not very much like it'd be a deep deal i think so the really fast the one in the fall right mm -hmm. so the temperatures are obviously dropping it's you're cold. looking more yeah you're looking more for like the cheese what they call it right because that's more heat right uh it the cheese would be more for a frog uh, just because it's hollowed out that much. And I was actually catching them. I, I weighed in almost every fish out of like a 100-yard stretch, kind of like he did. Um, but it was actually, I think there was little depressions where I was like, it's hard to explain. There's eelgrass everywhere on the lake. And where I was flipping, there was eelgrass everywhere. Like I could see it like all around my boat. But where the hydrilla was growing and like matted up, it was like dark under there. Like you'd get to the edge of it and you could see it like dip down. And I felt like those hmm. fish would just kind of get in there and they could like see a little bit and eat a lot better. And I just go back and forth down through there and about every hour I'd get a bite or two. And it's, I mean, they were just quality. I didn't ever catch a, I didn't catch a big bag, but you know, real consistent. Right. It's, it's such an interesting deal. Like it's a new territory for me and it is for, for Andrew, like flipping and how to, cause people, I think, I don't want to say the majority, but I think a lot of folks and they look at flipping, they think of, you know, you're just going to take any grass, any vegetation, whatever, you're going to flip at it. Mm -hmm. If nothing happens, you're going to reel it and flip at something else. When really there's a, there's a science behind, you yeah. know, timing of the year, how they're set up and what you should be. And obviously there's the flipping motion, but what you do once that bait hits the water can extremely impact the bite. Like yeah. if you're going to get bit or not. Yeah, and I mean it's the it's the same thing like talking to you guys about looking for a rock pile with small mouth. Like there's there you can tell guys like hey, there's going to be a small mouth on this rock pile, but it's got to be in the right depth. It's got to be the right time of year. The wind's got to be blowing this way. Like everything has to be set up right with the grass. And it's more about I don't even like starting to flip until I can like I see what I'm looking for. And that's like when me and Kyle went up there the other day, he hadn't done it a whole lot. And I rode around for 30 minutes before I kind of saw, and we caught a couple where I finally stopped because it, it finally looked like what I was looking for. And it's hard to explain it to somebody like that's not sitting there looking at it, but like mm -hmm. you can, and, and I've just learned this in the past three or four years, having to fish tournaments and getting my freaking brains beat in in grass. Like you have to learn how to read it it's, or you're going to waste three days of practice just fishing and you're never going to find, you may stumble upon them, but when you can r ride around and cover that much water and finally see what you're looking for, that's when the, the wheels start turning and you start actually like finding groups of fish. In it. And I think that's why Seth's so good because he knows what he's looking for and he doesn't fish. He doesn't waste time fishing until he finds exactly what he wants to be looking at. Right. That makes sense. And it's the same way with everything else. I mean, fishing out deep, I mean, with small mile, you know, school and spotted bass, like whatever. Everybody, it seems easy. But until you go try and do it, and it's like you're like, oh, there's a lot more to this than you think there is. Absolutely, right. So, I want to get into smallmouth, but before we do, I hate them uh, things. Can we just keep talking why? about flipping? <laughs> why? <laughs> I, I, I want to. So we'll end it with smallmouth because I do have a question. I think it'd be weird to transition to smallmouth and then back to swim jigs. Um, but going on your Neely Henry deal. Uh, mm -hmm. And something, you know, we talked after your win um, briefly and kind of got, I asked you br very briefly, like, why why the black and blue when everyone else is, is throwing white? And I remember you just playing out and told me that there was no reason behind it beyond that. It was just completely different than what everyone else was doing. Um, so I kind of want to break down this whole swim jig deal mm -hmm. uh, from setup, why you have this up the way it is, how you're throwing it. Are you doing, you know, that? What everyone talks about the Alabama shake, you know, having a rod seizure and you know, like <laughs> how you know, looks trailer. absurd. Yeah, <laughs> I, I want to break it all down. So, kind of, kind of dive into, you know, first why you're throwing black and blue, and then 
kind of yeah. Get the black and blue deal was a, and, and I swear, dude, it really was like, and I do it not just because our tournament was going on like for the past, you know, five years to where I've really got serious with a swim jig. I try and do the exact opposite of what everybody's doing around where I'm at on the Coosa River because, dude, that's that's all you hear. Like, if you Google Coosa River, you're gonna hear go throw a swim jig, a white swim jig in the grass, and that's what you know all our guys did. And I, you can catch some like that, and I caught. You know, I think one or two that morning on day four on the white one, just because it was such a predominant shad spawn, they were keying in on that so much. Like, it just – like, I, I just had to be throwing it, I felt like. But right. I lost a lot of fish and had a lot of them miss it, too, on the white one. But I just – when I made – and I, I had the black one tied on the whole week. Like, I, every day I threw it a little bit. I caught some on it, but they didn't really make a difference uh, from day one to day three. Um I actually lost a really big one on day three when I had that big bag right before I came in that nobody really knows about. Like it was bigger than the one I caught on the square bill uh, on the bridge. Like it was a, probably a six pounder. And, and I mean, that, but I mean, dude, I lost one every day. Like I lost one, a big one on the frog day one, day two. The tournament should have been over, but I mean, it was, I mean, I like the way it turned out. It was good TV. It was good for everybody. It was a good tournament. But the black, going back to the black and blue deal, like it just, the water was real muddy and it, the, the biggest key on day four was is when I picked it up, I threw it for about 10 minutes and didn't get a bite. And then when I got a bite, like, dude, it had it like choked. And I was like, dude, like, if I can get through, I told the camera, I don't know if it was on live. I said, if I can get three or four more bites on this, I said, we'll be okay. Because when one comes up on it, it's going to get it. And then, like, 30 minutes later, I caught, I actually, I threw, there was a clump with the current hitting it from the right. And for some stupid reason, I threw to the back side of the clump. Like instead of like the current facing side, like the way the fish is sitting. So you got the fish is sitting into the current and I'll throw to his tail on the back side of the clump of grass. And I come by the clump and I watch the clump like shake. The fish turn around and jumped over the swim jig. And I'm like, good God, dude. Like, did I just really do that? Because if I'd have brought it where he wanted it, like he'd have ate it. Like yeah. plain and simple. That's just what would happen. I sat there and I threw and I threw him about the third time. It got it again. I hooked it in the side of the jaw, luckily. Thank the God. Like, I mean, I don't know how I hooked it there, but it just, God was like, here, hook him right there and you'll get him. <laughs> got that one in the boat, fished around, caught another good one. Then I caught a big one at like 11. And I mean, on the camera, I mean, it's like, like I'm telling you, just something about that black and blue. They're just, they see that white all the time. They're like, man, I got to go hit it but they're real hesitant, so they don't really commit that much. And when they see that black one, it's just game on. Um, I don't normally get a lot of bites um, on the black one just because I don't know if they, can, they can't see it that good. It's not like a reaction, a flash deal. I think right. it's more of a feeding thing when they see that black one because they want to eat it instead of a reaction with the white one, which is why you get a lot of slaps and blow-ups and not a lot of good hookups with the white one. But you see a lot more fish with the white one. So it's kind of a give and take, whichever way you want to go about it. But I'd rather, if one comes up, I want him to eat it instead of seeing 10 and only catching one. That's, right. that's my general consensus on it. Around And that's around here. Like, I've been to other places that doesn't get a lot of swim jig pressure. Like, dude, you throw a white one, and it's gangbusters. Like, that's that's the one they want. Right. Like, I'm telling you, this uh, these rivers around here get so much pressure seven days a week, 365, and it's like swim jig flying everywhere like you're going down the river it's just like white <laughs> paper plates going everywhere <laughs> so is it straight black or is it black and blue it's actually I, my favorite is a hematoma i throw the dirty jigs no jack uh hematoma i throw a black um it's a black sapphire i think is the actual color of the the zoom super speed crawl but it's mainly black i mean it doesn't have a lot of blue in it at all i don't mm -hmm. think i don't I, you could probably throw a black and blue but i don't think he's gonna swim up to it but like oh it's got blue strands in it i'm not gonna eat it um but that's just that's the ones I buy. I buy or I order. I buy. I buy or I bought them. I don't have to buy them anymore. Thank God. But I order a white one, <laughs> solid white one, a hematoma one, uh, Alabama brim, and then I think it's a like a bluegill number two or something like that. That's the only four that I got. Like that's I, my whole box is full of those. That's the only ones to throw, in my opinion. Right. So, were you straight reeling it? Were you hopping it off the bottom? Were you yo-yoing it? Were you shaking it? I was I was shaking it. I mean, I you know, obviously y'all talked about the famous Alabama shake, and, and there's different ways to do it. It, it just kind of it just kind of depends on what you're throwing it around. Um, if you're in some real thick grass, like 
you know, dollar glass, grass, like flat lay. And you can, I still work it a little bit, but it's more of a straight deal. It's kind of just like, you know, just cruising across the top. You get to the edge of it, you let it fall, then you hop it up a little bit. Um, in that situation, it was just more isolated uh, stalk grass. So I was kind of just, you know, working it through it more like, almost like if you were throwing a spinnerbait up in the water column, like you're just working it around it, letting it bump a stalk, letting it fall a little bit. Not really a straight, you know, just crazy rod shaking action, but, you know, just giving it a little bit here and there to make it, make it just, I don't know, making it dance is what I call it. <laughs> So, so what's your rod reel line gear ratio set up for that? I'm a little different uh, than a lot of people. I throw it on a, a seven six medium heavy, and the medium heavy I throw it on it's an art reinforcer, and it's got a real parabolic bend to it. it it's kind of our offshore blank uh, rod that you know allows you to cast a long way, and, and the the bend goes way down into the rod, probably eighteen to you know two feet. And what that does is when that when that fish gets it and I've, I've got it on 65 or 60 pound sunline braid uh it's that that no jack hook dude i i, I don't give them no no slack like i mean they get it and I, I give it everything i got and the reason i do that is because of the rod allows because the braid has no stretch the rod bend allows that hook not to flex out i've never flexed one but i feel like you could on a flipping stick or something you know with that big a braid on a big fish like I don't care how you know stout of a hook you got, you don't need to jerk that hard on a heavy rod. And I and I've made just make mistakes on that. And the other thing about the real stiff rod is when you jerk that hard. Let's say you've got a, a two and three quarter fish, like dude, when you jerk, dude, you're gonna fly him out. I've done it a hundred times. If he's thirty yards out there, you're jerking twenty, and he'll land at the boat and come off. And you've ripped a gash in his face that's two or three inches long mm -hmm. from that big hook and that stout rod, like. You just don't need all that. Now, if you hook a six pounder, it's fine. But how many six pounders do you truly catch all the time? Like most of the time, your bites are going to be a two and a half to a three pounder mostly. And you just don't need all that power for that technique. And that's that's really why I use the medium heavy. The seven six is kind of just a personal thing. So I don't wear my arms out, like holding my rod up, trying to keep the jig up because I like to see mine a lot of the times. Most guys like a, a seven foot to a seven two. I just I don't like having to work that hard and our rods are so light that I mean the seven six feels just like the seven two or seven foot. So that's 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 basically the setup. And the reel is a, a loose pro TI. It's a seven five to one. I don't like I don't like getting into the, to the eights. Uh, I feel like you lose a lot of power, especially yeah. on a big fish. If you're in like if he if he gets it like behind some grass. Um, it was an instance at Fork. I caught a big one, and it was kind of behind some stuff. And I mean, I was just able to keep. You know, you're even if you have an eight, your reel still going to be reeling, but you're not going to be moving nothing. Like it's just going to be the drag system, like just mm -hmm. grinding in there. Um, but with the lower power, you've got a little bit of power or lower gear ratio. You've got a little bit of power to get it out. And I mean, it's seven's a good one. Six is too slow. Eight's just you lose the power of me. So seven's a real happy medium, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I've kind of adopted that concept of I really don't even go over like a, a seven three to one. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the only exception is I have uh, an eight four to one and it's on uh, my my big worm rod for when I have the line way I'm making really long. Mm -hmm. and I want to catch up. That's the only time I use anything over. Yeah, eight, for sure. Over seven three for that. Yeah. Matter. And you can get away with, you know, a high gear out stuff like that. But the, the concept of oh, I'm flipping, I need to be using an eight or nine something gear ratio to get my bait in faster. That's, that's, I mean, it's a good selling point. That's fine. I mean, lose makes some eight, eight gear ratio reels. And that's, if that's what you like, that's fine. But if I hit an eight pounder in a mat, I don't want to have an eight or nine gear ratio reel. Like you get stuck. Yeah. I can get my bait in with a seven, five, a split second. It may be a split second slower with a seven instead of an eight, but it, it's going to make a big difference in the, in the long run. Yeah. And, and really quick. So I know, obviously you mentioned, you know, that with that gear ratio gets stuck, but kind of explain to people why you don't want like a nine or something, especially when you're flipping, right? And you set the hook into a fish, a big fish, why you don't want that really high gear ratio. Like explain exactly what happens. Yeah, basically when you set the hook and you've got the high gear ratio, you're, you can, re the real handle is going to turn, but your actual spool, the gears in there are not big enough to, from your reel handle to your spool to turn it because with the smaller spool they're smaller gears they move faster 
and it, it's just it's just like a bicycle. The best way I've heard to explain it is it's like a bicycle, and you're going uphill. If you want to get up the hill faster, and it, you know, obviously, it's you got an incline and it's getting harder. You go in a lower gear to get because you're able to keep up with it. If you try and go up a hill in ninth or tenth gear, you you ain't gonna be doing nothing. Like you're just gonna be spent sitting there spinning. It's the same concept with the reel on a five or six, seven pounder in a mat, like he's just going to be sitting there wallowing and you can't do anything with him. Like, yeah, you can pull him with a rod, but you're not going to be taking up any line to where if your reel is able to do that, now you can pull him with the rod and pick up the line all at the same time. And it, your odds just increase with that situation. Now you're going to lose fish on it. You could lose fish on a three to one gear ratio or a 10 to gear ratio. I mean, you're just going to lose some sometimes dealing with stuff like that, but when you're in some real thick stuff, the swim jig, a frog, whatever, I, I, I tend to lean to the 75 for that exact reason because you're just going to be able to pick up line when the and when you have the eight, you're you're just going to be sitting there spinning your wheels, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Andrew, are you clicking a pen? No, I'm not clicking anything. Oh, I keep hearing like a clicking sound. I was like, what? Is the freaking <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that was a interesting concept for me too. To kind of learn, because like it took for me to for it actually to happen. Where mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I got. Oh yeah, it. and when it and when it happens, you know what's going on. You're like, dude, I can't do nothing. Like I'm handcuffed. Like I can't. Yeah. I can't move. Like, you're just like at a stalemate, right. like yeah. holding it. And you're like, yep, I got to get rid of this thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like no when I fish a heavier, like a heavier weight, I'll go to the seven. But if I'm flipping around like a quarter ounce weight, I'll use the eight to one just yeah. because a lot of times. They're eating it on the fall and they're running thirty feet For off sure. the left. And, so and that's that's another that's the one reason that you could use a higher one that I could see because there's a lot of times like when you're fishing isolated stuff like dock posts or something, dude, you pick up and he's you know, he's, ten feet to your right. Yeah. There, yeah. It's hard to catch up. I used to fish with a like a long time like when I was first starting out fishing, we used to a Shimano, a cast day it. Like it was the one with the oh, flipping yeah. bar. And it was like a, like a, almost a five, nine or a six, one. And dude, that would happen all the time. We'd be trying to reel it up. <laughs> like you'd lose so many. It's crazy. But. My buddy's dad has a couple of the old cast stakes with the flipping oh, yeah. bar. And he oh, yeah. loves them. He throws it out. I think it's like an old seven foot 10 Daiwa light and tough is what That's he throws awful. it on. And he That's just jam one ounce jig all day yeah. long with that rod. And he jams on them. There's a bunch of guys that I fish with. That are a lot older than me around here. They that's all they use, dude. It's like a brick. Like it's like I, I pick one. I got a bunch of the old ones that my dad still likes to use. I'm like, dude, this thing is a brick. Like I don't know how I fished with this. Like, He's like, this is the best flipping reel ever. I'm yeah. Like it doesn't fit in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> that bar is pretty cool. Like I yeah. do like the bar, but to integrate it into our reels today, I don't. I don't know how it would be. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I, the the loose pro ti has been impressive to me from a power standpoint and the size. Like, cause I don't have the biggest hands, but for me to be able to hold it and fill my line, like, I, that's just, I'm a big, big proponent of feeling like holding the line on my finger. Like there's a lot of times I get a bite. Like I don't think I would have known it, especially flipping. I mean, obviously flipping, but. You see a lot of guys uh, kind of do a mixture of that, right? So there's like you and fighters who do like the, I think you, what you're saying is you keep your pointer finger on that line right to yeah the it's it's up under like dude i got scars on my finger you can't sit in the camera from line, like jerking like as i oh, like yeah. i felt them get it on the line and i jerk and it just slices into my finger but that's the only mm -hmm. downfall of that but it's but yeah but and, and i may i may have picked it up from fighter i mean dude I, i'm serious like i studied this guy when it come to grass because i mean <laughs> that's just i probably need to study some guys on the small mouth but i'm too addicted <laughs> yeah. to <the> right <laughs> Get Taco Ito and the Johnston brothers and just study them for no hours. doubt, no oh, doubt, man. Me and Taco Taco's done said I need to take him swim jig fishing and he'll take me to Dis smallmouth Disneyland. I'm like, that I'm, like a I'm down. In. in, no <laughs> doubt. That sounds like a great trade. Yeah. Um, but what I was saying is, you sometimes you see. I think I, honestly, I think I see it more with a lot of these traditional older guys. Is what they'll do is when they, when they flip, say, with their left hand and they're holding the line with their right hand when they're mm -hmm. flipping. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's they, that's the traditional like the way I grew up. That's actually flipping, like where they pull the line and you know kind of. And I still do that a lot too. Right. Like, it just depends on the situation. We hadn't had a tournament that's set up to do that. Uh, heck, I can't even remember what I've done. I may have did it a little bit at Neely, um, 
but yeah, you kind of just pull your line and as you pull it, whichever hand you pull it with, you kind of keep it in your finger as you drop it down and then you just pick it back up and go to the next one. That's the true D Thomas, Denny Brower, you know, young hackney, the, the actual flipping deal. What we all call flipping now is actually called pitching. Like mm -hmm. the, the true flipping is pulling the line, like right. pulling string is what we call it. One of my best friends, Kyle Dorsett, that's, that's all he does is pull strings, what we call it. And he's, he's one of the best I know at that still does it. But like that's, yeah. that's a big thing around here on the Coosa, just, just dropping grass, pulling strings. Well, yeah, Love and that, it. but like <laughs> I, what I was trying to, what I was getting at is like, it wasn't even that concept. Like they'll flip and they'll mm -hmm. hold the line with their right hand and they'll like either pull up or they're shaking it yeah. and then they'll reel back in. So they're like, what you're doing is feeling with your left hand with your real hand. Mm -hmm. They're just taking their other hand and feeling the line and then just reeling back in. Yeah. Yeah. And they may not be comfortable like holding the reel, you know, you know, it, a lot of people hold the reel a lot of different ways. I, yeah. I bear, like I've got my pinky around the trigger grip and that's the only thing I've got on the whole bottom of the rod, yeah. which makes my finger belt to hold up there. And it just depends on whatever you're comfortable with. I mean, however you want to do it would be fine. I just, I feel like you need to be at least paying attention to your line a lot more than a lot of people think because it, it not, not saying you're not going to feel the bite, but you may hook him a lot better if you see him get it on the fall instead of picking up like we were talking about a second ago and he's 30 right. feet to your right. Yeah. I hate it when they do that. Speaking of that topic. Like, <laughs> that sounded like a personal deal. Like, God, I hate it when they do <laughs> I mean, I love it because they're eating it, but I'm yeah. just like, oh. <laughs> But so like really fast, there's some guys where you either watch my live and it's not just the elites that do it. Like it's every trail or even buddies that I've fished with. Some of them, do they have like the grip where it's like the, so like the, I don't even know what part you want to call it, but basically that lip that's under your bait caster where they have their pointer finger under that and their hands below the bait caster. I don't know how the heck guys do that. You talking I, about like the old timey, like they holding the pistol grip, like yeah, real, like yeah, this. Yeah. yeah, like their, their hands oh, like the trigger. Real, like, the trigger. That's the trigger. Yeah, yeah. So they have like it's like they're pointing a pistol, and like, <laughs> dude, I, I, dude, I've tried it just out of like curiosity, and I'm like, this is gross. I don't Come know. On, Bailey, Bailey, don't call them out like that, man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. I'm just. I'll, I'll tell anybody that I don't care who you are. I mean, you could be the most uh, successful guy but like <laughs> it just feels gross to me like, how do you set the hook on these things i don't know dude like you see all them old clips of like the first bass masters and stuff they got them round abus and they're just sitting there just on their butt seat just <laughs> really bill dancing bill dancing it up oh, i've man. seen a couple of, like current guys that still do it and like they're still really successful and it's like i couldn't them, like i couldn't do it I would set the hook in the rod and go. Yeah, that I'd be way. like a monkey humping a football. Like I wouldn't know what. Was going on. <laughs> Dude, it's, it's it, to me using that and like casting or even trying to work a bait is like completely switching hands. Like yeah. it just feels completely weird, yeah. and it shows that's you how, kind of how hey, like, hey, that's how I feel with a spinning rod in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. My golly, that's oh, here's another interesting concept. So. I get called weird all the time because I reel right handed with a bait caster, but I also reel right handed with a spinning rod. And I get called weird for that. I think it's weird to is that reel the, right with a bait caster and then reel left with a spinning rod. Is that the only thing you get called weird for? I, no. That's, no, that's just, uh, that's just one of the cool things on the list. <laughs> so you reel, you reel the same with both one, both of them? Yeah. yeah. I, see, I do opposite. I reel left handed with a spinning reel. That's just because whatever I, I'm like, well, everybody else. Yeah, it's I, like, don't know. I don't I haven't it's found way more a single comfortable. person who does it with like if if someone does that and you're listening or watching, please message me. Wait, so wait a minute. Y'all y'all don't turn y'all y'all spinning reels on the bottom, y'all sitting on the top like mine. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder I hadn't been catching no small man. <laughs> you got a reel backwards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh God. Oh. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I got it upside down out there about everything. <laughs> Right up, upside down spinning reels. Oh, I love it. Sign oh, me up. Man. But so yeah, let's let's break into that real quick because there's uh, been uh, there's been this debate, and I feel like a lot of people have been covering it, diving into it, and I don't think there's ever really going to be a solid answer for it because it kind of changes with generation and anglers and who's fishing what, and obviously schedule plays a big big deal in there too, but. Talking about northern anglers, if it's harder to go northern to go south, or for southern anglers to go north. Um, and I you want my opinion on that? I want, I want your opinion on it. 
I think it's, and I'm not saying this just because I'm a Southern guy, I think it's easier for Northern guys to fish Southern than Southern guys to fish Northern because even being up North, you still have largemouth fishing to go do, like shallow yeah. grass, millfoil, frogging, flipping dock, fishing boat docks. There's a few lakes you can fish deep, like cranking for largemouth, stuff like that. Now there's a certain, you know, the ledge fishing deal, the current, stuff like that. It's a little bit different, but all in all, like, the northern guys have fished for largemouth in their life. Like, dude, I've never fished for a smallmouth. I mean, there's a difference in a Tennessee River smallmouth and a yeah. St. Lawrence River smallmouth, I can promise you. Like, like you can catch smallmouth on Pickwick on a square bill and a swim bait in six foot of water at oh, the blow a dam. so much fun. Like, <clears throat> you're not going to go up to St. Lawrence and throw a square bill down the bank and catch 25 pounds of smallmouth. It's just not going to happen. Like, I ain't going to say it ain't going to happen, but you're not going to do it like you do down here. <laughs> <laughs> because like i mean the what i'm the point i'm getting at is there's nowhere down here to go drop a, a dr drop shot in 40 foot of water with three minor current or fish with six pound line on drop like it's just not a thing that we grow up doing like you if we catch smallmouth down here it's more of a power fishing deal not saying you don't power fish up there too but from a finesse standpoint I think it's harder for us to go up there and get adjusted to it than it is for them to come out here and fish for largemouth. Just me personally speaking, it's not hard. It's not hard to go catch smallmouth up north. It's catching yeah. enough weight to compete in a tournament. That's that's the biggest deal that I don't think a lot of people understand. That because I have a lot of buddies that text me, they're like, "Man, I've been watching live at Champlain and St. Lawrence. That's the funniest place ever." I'm like, "Yeah, come up here and get you some, big boy." Like you fish all day and catch 10 two pounders, and you come in and everybody's blasted 18 to 20. Like it's not easy. You're like, what the heck? Yeah. yeah you're <laughs> like, gosh, dang, dude, what in the crap is going on? And I mean, <laughs> it's the biggest thing of, you know, pulling up on this rock pond, there's three and a half to fours instead of two and a quarter to two and a half. And from what I've seen, and I, I'm just like, it's like y'all talking about y'all don't know what's going on with the grass, which y'all probably do, but. I, I'm 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 pretty much lost with them smallmouth. I ain't gonna lie. I don't want to say that real loud. All right, really fast. <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna apologize to people watching and listening. I think there's a fourth person hacking our thing that's just clicking a pen constantly. That's <laughs> all I can hear is just clicking a pen. I have not heard of clicking yet. <laughs> oh, there's the key. It's Wes. It is Wes because I hear it too, and I'm like, what is going on? I can hear. Like I heard something, but it's I was like, like I don't. Dude, I really, I don't even know if I have a pen around here. It literally just sounds like, I thought it might be my thing bouncing, but it's, I don't know. Oh, that's what no, it is. That, that's what is it, it is, yeah. I want you to sit it. there, and I want you to hold it for the okay. rest of the show. Yeah, just like that. I got it. Yep. <laughs> it's gone, but it's gone. I think it was from, like, it rubbing against it's Probably shirt. hitting my shirt. Yeah. Yep. For sure. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> saying, it's West, shut up. Stop giving out secrets. West, so, shut up. It was like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Oh, God. Are oh, y'all talking about this pen I got? <laughs> it, it, this I'm like, he's sabotaging us down there with the pen. <laughs> and earlier, I asked Andrew if he was clicking a pen because when I first brought Andrew on as a co host, there was a couple of times where he'd have a pen because he would take notes. He and he'd be clicking, clicking it. it. Like, Andrew, I'm stuck with the pen. Like, like He's taking notes, that man. I was like, damn it, he's doing it again. <laughs> no, called I, don't, I don't hear it now. So hey, we're all good. I don't think people really care. If people care that much, then, you know, well, that's all good. They probably just didn't want to listen to me if, they, if that bothers them, which I can't blame them. <laughs> they just unfollowed you on all their social medias and said, I want to listen to this guy anymore. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. Always the clicker. Got a new name, the clicker. A little ball of click. <laughs> right. So kind of getting back to smallmouth. Um, so like you mentioned, when you, once you – when you go up to smallmouth, once you find those smallmouth, they're not hard to catch. Mm. And guys in the south, it's not like electronics is a brand new thing to you guys. You guys know how to read maps. Mm -hmm. You guys know how current works. Yep. So it's not like you guys don't know how to find them on your electronics. What is the biggest learning curve then? Is it just kind of getting acclimated to techniques to catch your small catch smallmouth? Like what what's the learning curve for southern guys going up north? I don't. I can't speak for a lot of guys because I, I truly haven't talked to a lot of people about up there. Um, you know, I, I travel with Atkins this year, and you know, he I, he I feel like he's a really good smallmouth guy from the south. Like obviously, he almost he did real good at yeah. Ontario. 
but just from a, a like a small mouth mindset, like he understands what's going on. And I feel like that's the biggest thing with me is I'll actually like the few times I've been up there last year and this year, I've found an area or two that had some quality fish in it, but you have to have more than one or two places the in the situation I've been in. And I can't seem to figure out like, I can't it's hard to I, replicate it. I'm a pattern guy. That's how I grew. That's how I grew up. Like around here, we, you, you figure out a pattern and you can run it. Well, smallmouth aren't patterns. You, you fish this rock pile over here. You fish this current break. There's one rock on this flat on St. Lawrence that somebody goes and throws a hair jig on and catches a four pounder on it for the last 20 years. Like I don't have that rock and I don't know how to go <laughs> find that rock. So it's more of, <laughs> and I think a lot of smallmouth is history because I think they get back in the same places over and over again. Yeah. Like once they learn, Hey, I can eat right here. They go back to it, you know, and if his buddies are over there, he's like, well, I'm going to go join him. Like, I'm not just going to swim over here in the abyss. So they like, they keep going to these places. So once you get, enough places like if you've gone there a bunch of times like i caught some fish at champlain i caught some there last year i caught some fish at st lawrence that i caught some last year like they get on the same general places every year so and i feel like the more areas you have at some point during the day you're gonna run into five good ones that's just from the the way i can see it going down and i just i haven't spent enough time up there i've never went and pre-fished or just fished up north like the only time i've actually been on the water it's for practicing for a tournament or during the derby. So I feel like the biggest thing I need to do is spend more time on those bodies of water because we're going to go back to all of them. Like it's right. like you've got your five or six that you're going back to every time. Like, And once you figure out where they're at in June, where they're at in August, the middle of July, I mean, you, you can go back and check and see what stage the fish are in. Then you're already ahead of the game from somebody that's just trying to look around and get a bite. And I mean, that's, yeah. the, that's the main thing I think I've got to work on and figure out. Yeah. It's, and then for you guys too, like you have to fish or you have to practice for, if you want to go up and learn St. Lawrence, you have to do it like now yeah. because yeah. it's St. Lawrence by the time, you know, the season usually ends for you guys, it's getting close it's to where it's a completely different time of year yeah. for one, but Two, I mean, St. Lawrence has – you can't fish at certain times of the year. Like, yeah. And for you guys, and when season opener comes around, I mean, it's it's too late for you guys to even go because mm -hmm. it's usually less than a month away. Once yeah, and open. I mean, even like, like any of those lights, like if I wanted to go to Champlain, like you can't go in September or October, dude. It's either 40 degrees or the wind's going to be blowing 700, and it ain't like you're going to find somewhere to fish in July in October – you know, no, like whatever, it's not going to happen. Like it's a totally different because stuff up there moves in two week periods instead of two months, like it does down here. Forty degrees, you chicken. I mean, <laughs> so I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind it'd it. Being, be, it'd just be forty in the morning in the afternoon, October first two weeks of October. We get seventies all the time. I'd be fine, but I, from a fish standpoint, like he's going to be in a different place in October than he's going to be in Ju the first of July. I mean, that's just a. Now you go for to catch them, like catch the crap out of them. I'm sure I'd probably be a blast. They'd be fat and fun, but I don't know. I, it's not fun to me if I can't catch them in the tournament. Like that's the whole. Like I'm not a big just go fun fishing guy. Like I like to like I fish to catch them to get paid. Like, that's my job. But I the think other side a... of that is going to figure them out and spending time just getting confidence in a technique, like this bait on a drop shot around here, throwing a whatever a hair jig a jerk bait just getting a lot of confidence and i mean the northern guys have done it too the guys that are real successful up north down south they spend a lot of time down here like that's just mm -hmm. part of, i mean that's that's part of it you got to put in the work to get it out right and i think there's a thing to be said about guys that come up here this time of year even in the fall uh or maybe even the early spring on lakes that like because our, our entire state you can uh, besides the St. Lawrence River, you can fish the entire state, no matter if it's out of season or not. You just can't mm -hmm. put them in live well. Gotcha. So like, gotcha. there's guys, and I've seen them. I've seen them around. Like I've talked mm -hmm. to them. They come up early, and the, all they do, like how you mentioned, how smallmouth. You know, it's more of a spot deal, right? Where yep. you have to have as more rock piles, the better. You know, whatever, it, whatever it may be. Guys will just come out and they just they just graph. They don't even fish. Yep. They graph. Yep. Just and then just check it all when they come back. And I mean that's 
I mean, that's putting in the time. That's putting in the work. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's how you're going to be successful up there. And I know that. I mean, just sometimes you can have time to go up there. Sometimes you don't. I mean, it is what it is. You're just too scared of that cold weather, aren't you? No, nah, <laughs> just if it's cold somewhere, that means there's a deer to be killed. <laughs> <laughs> i love i love bragging on uh my friends from the south when they complain about like 40 50 degree mornings because to me that i can't wait heck. that's yeah, why i prefer that's good. to wait <laughs> but then like i got one of my one of my best friends zach hall is from louisiana he lo- he hates it he hates the cold he loves 90 degrees where i am miserable when it's like above 75 mm-hmm. i hate the heat it, it's kind of yeah. interesting to see how that works but um yeah, no, it's just a, it's an interesting concept to see how there's like an interesting like I want to say a, a comp, more of like a comparison, right? Of southern guys going north and northern guys going south, mm-hmm. and seeing in the off season who's spending more time where. You can kind of see guys will be majority of the guys, the guys that are successful, are spending more time in areas that are they're weak in to try to obviously. Yeah. Get, and then you see the next year or the year maybe the year after that, you see them get a top thirty or a top mm-hmm. twenty, and you're like, huh. He was ne- he was eighty second, you know, yeah. a couple years ago. Starting to figure it out a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's kind of cool, and you kind of see those guys put that work in. I mean, I, I'm sure he's not the only one. You know, we had Daryl on. I brought this up, and Daryl's like, he was not the only one. He's probably the only one posting about it. It's like Taku Ito Ardi in South Dakota, oh, you know, yeah. Lake, Lake Oahe. Like it's guys like you know they do this for a living. There, it's insane the you know the the road lifestyle that you guys live because it does not stop even in the off season. Like, no. It, it's no. cliche. It, it just, it really does not stop. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody's like, what are you going to do in the off season? I'm like, well, I mean, you either go look around at other lakes or you work with your sponsor to go do media events. Like it's, it's not like we just fish for eight events and then you're just done. Like you don't do nothing. Now, I mean, there's not like week in and week out, like you're wide open, like normal, but I mean, there's still stuff to be done. I mean, it's actually the real work in my opinion. Like the fishing mm-hmm. comes second really from the business and, you know, and, you know, preparing for once we get, I mean, luckily I say luckily in a way we got the schedule out early this year. I mean, it's kind of good and kind of bad in a way, but it is what it is. Right. Yeah. It's that, that's an interesting deal is like, and we talked a little bit with Destin because, so I travel the Northern opens mm-hmm. with Destin and with, because the, the schedule's announced. So technically elite guys, they're, you're not supposed to, talk about those places with non elite. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so now it's like the guys who are in the elites who are pretty <clears> open <throat> are like, they can't get information. They can't talk about it, but the opens guys can, it puts them at a disadvantage. Yeah, I, I so agree. It's, really interesting <clears throat> concept. It, it's, it's a, a not knock at anybody. It's just, it's just, yeah, it's a, a situation. It's a weird, it's a weird deal. And I mean, like there's nothing wrong with like, you know, we're discussing, just talking northern up here and st lawrence gets referenced or wherever else we're going Oahe, just something like that but from a, we can't get information like me asking you where i would go here or where i would go there and then but it, then it you get into a, a bind of a deal like if you're at a gas station the guy just walks up to you he's like hey if you're gonna go here you need to go do this and then you're kind of just like well i didn't ask for it and like what am i supposed to like be rude to a guy like i'm on elite series hey, i can't just tell a fan to be like hey dude don't talk to me like i can't i can't know anything like shut up man like you're yeah, talking to like, hey dude like, hey dude shut up like, I, like you can't you can't do all that you just kind of have to brush it off and the main thing is not acting from what i've from the rules the way i read it's not acting on anything or like purposely trying to go get something like that's where right. it gets real sketchy and stuff like Going that out of your way to, yeah, yeah to get and and i mean i i'm i know there's not a lot of that that goes on i hope there's not um but I mean, that's a, that's a different topic for a different deal, but it does make it a little bit challenging. It getting brought out this early when there's still a lot of tournaments to be fished, even on those same bodies of water that we're going to be on next year. It, it just makes it a little bit tougher for those guys that are still in those events. And I know there's quite a few guys that are, you know, going to be fishing the open. I think there's a Toyota at St. Lawrence too, a Toyota series sometime coming up. And I think a few guys are wanting to fish it. I mean, I mean, that's what we are. We're bass fishermen. Like we, we fish tournaments to make money, whatever the tournament is, whatever organization, if we're able to fish, I mean, we want to go fish. Right. That's a, that's a super interesting system. Mm-hmm. How it all works. But, you know, talk, I know you mentioned it a little bit earlier and you said that the schedule doesn't really set up for the way you like to fish. And 
Dude, honestly, I'm looking at that beginning of the schedule, and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, that's right <laughs> up your alley. I mean, it does, it does, and it may just be from a, you know, last year, we obviously, we had three tournaments in Alabama. Like, I wasn't going to have to travel far. I was going to have my girlfriend there staying with me. And, I mean, truthfully, I feel like I do a lot better when I can stay with her, me and her stay together. Like, the two best tournaments I had this year, or three best, she stayed with me at Pickwick, she stayed with me at Gunners one, she stayed with me at um, Neely. And, I mean, I think she just kind of keeps my head on straight. And with, with some of them not being real it's close. a little. Yeah, it, it – I don't know. <laughs> she does. I'll come yeah, in after practice. Them. I'll come in after practice, be pissed off. She's like, oh, you can get that out of here. Like, uh, we ain't bringing that oh, out here. <laughs> Comes west but, of the tail between his legs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yes, sure. ma'am. You sit outside in the rain until you calm down. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I've been there before. That's for sure. You can you can stay outside, my God. But uh, no, I mean it, it may have just been from that. But I mean, really looking at it, they're going to set up, you know, pretty good. I think. Obviously, St. John's again. Um, I don't even know where the second tournament's at. I can't even. Uh, second tournament's Harris Chain. See, I don't like Harris Chain. I've been there twice, and I've never I've never done very well. I fished. Um, an open there and an FLW tournament there. And I just, now I didn't, I'll say the, the open I fished there was in like four, 13 or 14, whenever it was, um, did horrible. I didn't really know what I was doing. And then the first year of the tour I fished there and I still feel like I didn't know what I was doing, but, and I may be able to do better now. I don't know. Uh, but just the two tournaments I have had there have been bad and that will be a shallow water deal, but it, it's still a Florida shallow water deal where, you know, it, it's kind of, on the table. yeah, it, it could be a, you know, offshore, what, I don't even, I don't even want to get into it because I don't even want to talk about that place. <laughs> it, it's a great fishery. Now, it's got a lot of fish and, and big ones. It'll be a good tournament, but right. I mean, it, it's kind of up in the, it's not like a, like a, I don't know, like the Santee Cooper, like I know in our, our we got one there, like that's going to be a good tournament for everybody. Mm -hmm. Like there'll be a sight fishing deal postpone pre-spawn like it, it'll be a shallow water fishing tournament to where you know i'm kind of confident but the the june tournament the one that's not announced scares me the most because i feel like they're really wanting to go to a tennessee river lake like a ledge deal and i do not want to do that i just don't don't like ledges though huh don't like ledges huh no god no dude heck no like i'd rather take Stuff there, everybody's just other. stacked on top of each other. Like the the maps are so good now. It's not like you're not going to find a sneaky hole or something. I mean, you might somebody whoever wins the tournament's probably going to, but they're going to have a graph for three days and not made a cast. Like I'm not good enough to see them. Like I'm not good like you are. Like I can graph down this little place. And be like all right, there's four of them over there. Like no, if I see them, dude, there's a megawatt of them there. Like that's the only way I'm gonna find them. I ain't gonna find like a couple just off the beaten path and stuff. But Wes doesn't see him until the side imaging says they are. Here. Yeah, there's like arrows <laughs> pointing now, like this is bass. This is bass. Everywhere. <laughs> right. And I've got, I mean, I run the best stuff there is. And I mean, I'm sure they're there. I'm just like, I don't know. But like, I can go up to the bank and be like, hey, there's a stretch of grass over. I bet there's one or two in that. When Zal Dane's out here just jacking them on a spoon, just six and seven pounders left and right. And I'm over here catching twos. Dude, watch it. Total sidebar. Watch him do that. With a spoon with smallmouth on Champlain was awesome. So I didn't watch it. He yeah, I think he's using, yeah, I think he's using Mega Live. Like day nice. one or day two, yeah. No, yeah. I think they probably they I mean realistically those smallmouth would have eaten absolutely anything. Anything that come by. Yeah. And like, you know, logis like logically you'd probably be like, Hey, I should probably throw like a drop shot and make sure mm -hmm. my landing ratio is there. But was that yeah. like, nah, big nah. spoon. Let's go. <laughs> Straight <laughs> break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, that's awesome! Oh, that would yeah. terrify me. A big, like four pound smallmouth and an eight inch spoon just flying. Like that's just recipe for disaster. Oh yeah, I yeah, feel like it's gonna end up in my face or <laughs> recipe for badass. So I've I've <laughs> never seen a bass hit a top water like they do there. Like it's the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen. Like it's cool. it's so addicting. Like I think about like that's how I was catching them and lost like a bunch, but it's still just like addicting. <laughs> but you can't stop. <laughs> yeah, you just keep throwing it out there. Like I'm probably gonna lose him, but I'm gonna fling it back out there again. <laughs> click, 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 click. <laughs> oh, he's off. <laughs> yeah, like he pulls for a second. Oh, that one come off, and it's like floating back up, and another one like jumps on top of us. Like, oh my god, can't get it yeah, up. 
it's it's actually like uh really impressive to take so you go and you, when you take your hooks off and you see like especially those champlain smallies how many times they will hit it in a row it's insane they'll eat, mm. they'll try to eat it all the way to the boat oh yeah, oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun too but yeah um really fast i had a, had a question that came up in my head and obviously i think this is it's probably a stupid question because there's only so many things that could be on a tennessee river when you look at for guys that at least that know their side imaging or down imaging but like you see in the north like i think gus he's talked about it a bunch where he uses his underwater camera right his aqua mm-hmm. view where when he's graphing like he'll graph mm-hmm. with the camera mm-hmm. do you guys do that at all on, on ledge fisheries i don't know if the water's clear enough um i don't know if the, the clarity is good enough like because i mean dude the places he does it you can see 20 feet 20 15 right. 20 feet when the sun's out i don't i think i don't know i think some guys have tried it i don't know anybody personally but i'm sure somebody's tried it i don't know if it's i don't know if it's as good as you think it would be and the only reason i think that is i think from a pressure standpoint i think um, you go to be bopping around in those fish and your boat just kind of barely easing over like dude they're gone like, and they may come back. I'm sure they'll come back. But from like being able to graph them, turn around and fish for them, I, I don't think that would be. I don't. I don't know that that would work great. Now I think it would be better on like a like a clear water deal, like dropping it in a brush pile or something. I think you could. It would benefit from there a lot more than like graphing a ledge or something like a Lanier or a Smith or something like that. Like just straight down. See some in there. Yeah, they might swim off a little bit. But at least you know you know, the spots are using this pile. There's nothing in this one. This is a good pile, you know, stuff like that where you can see a pile on your graph, but you really don't know what it is. Like you just kind of yeah. see something down. I'm sure yeah. I'm sure there's guys doing it. They just don't talk about it. Probably make sure this isn't some crappie. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Instead of having to throw out there or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well speaking about alleged fishery, um, I feel like you got to be kind of excited for Chickamauga though. Mm, Especially with that time of year. Yeah, I, I've actually I've I got two top tens in chick uh in a coast and an open, but it was at the end of April and the water had just come up. I don't I think we're gonna be a little bit behind that. Um now if we get a warm spring, I think it, it'll be a spawning tournament too. But I it's it'll be good. I mean, obviously chick's one of the you know, the best tournaments or best tournament lakes in the country, but it fishes small. Um but it, it I mean it'll fish a little bit bigger in April. Uh it'll 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 be good. I, I'll, depending on the water, if it floods and something, I'd love it. Like it, it's right up my alley. But if it's low, it'll be a little bit of a, a challenge for me personally. But yeah, I wish it was about April twentieth instead of April seventh. Like two weeks makes a big difference in April around here. Right, that makes sense. Um, I think one that kind of sets up in your wheelhouse, and I'm actually curious to hear if you've been there before. Um, is the last one, Mississippi River. I feel like that's one you're probably pretty excited for. I uh, uh, The year I qualified for the elites, I led going into the final day of the Open. I finished third. Um, but it sets up real similar to how I learned like learned how to fish. And I didn't realize it set up like it did until about the second day of practice for that Open. And I, 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 I tried something. Like I checked something like, hey, this sets up like the house. And it was like, bam, bam, bam. I was like, oh, I got you now. And then I was able – it sets up like a pattern deal. It's a straight pattern deal. And once you figure out how they're set up, like, you can run it. And it's not like 25-pound bags. Like, you catch 12 or 13 and catch a 4 or 5-pounder, and you're, like, you know, top five. Yeah. That's – Did you cool. have any brown in your bags for that tournament? I caught a 312 smallmouth on day two. Top water? No, flipping. What? Yeah. Is that a normal thing there? No, I don't know. <laughs> I, <laughs> no <idea. laughs> I have no idea. Probably but he bit it, he bit it and I called him. That's all I know. Andrew, Andrew, we've had like half the state of Minnesota on this show, and I've never asked that question before. No. We're I don't know why I never – I'm going to text Bart. You might Bart. have to talk to Bart. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Good gosh. That, that's an interesting question. I don't – I mean, I can't think of many places you can go and flip grab me in Champlain. I feel like you could probably do it. Um, I think, I think I might have done it. Like, a, I could probably count in my hand how many times on the Finger Lakes I've done it, where you can flip grass and catch a small amount. I've I've caught them on just about every Finger Lake I've fished flipping grass, but they're never any giants like two, two and a half. Now, like a Finger Lake, that's like Cayuga and all them, right? Yeah. 
There, there's like ten of them. Never been in one of them. Oh, there's so much fun. Really? <laughs> and they're all different. Every hmm. one of them. They all got grass. Eh, not now because they keep spraying the damn things. Oh, some of them do. Got some have that. grass. Some don't. But okay, have healthy grass consistently. Not a damn one. None of them. No, no there is one, they but I won't mention it. it on here that has consistent healthy grass. Yeah, they might go. You say something. Maybe they go get fished by a thousand people, or, or it'll go get sprayed tomorrow. Yeah. Honey oil is not a juice hole. I'm okay. not talking about honey oil, actually. <laughs> I don't even know why you brought that up then. <laughs> there's so there's so much grass poison and gunners will do. It's unbelievable. Like, uh, yeah, that, was, that was fields of milfoil in the back of this in one creek up there that I saw in our elite. And I'm like, dude, it was almost topped out. Like it was kind of starting to cheese up already. And I was like, if I come back up here in like August, September, it'll be a frog heaven. There's not a sprig left. It's all gone. Completely gone. Bomb. Yeah, yeah. There's a lake around us. Um, it was actually my home lake growing up. I was about five minutes from it at our my family's old house. Um, and it was called Canisius. And it, you know, five, six years ago was probably, it would give, you know, I, I know this is kind of a bold statement, and I don't think it does to that capacity, but it was almost to that point where it could give Champlain a run for its money for mm. the grass fishery. Um, you know, Cayuga is probably our best largemouth fishery now, in this, I would say, in the state in terms of size. But Canisius used to, I would say, beat that. Like, mm. Canisius was, it was a place where you could go and you could do anything under the sun because the grass was so healthy. Now it is a slime hole. It is the crappiest of the crap. The God, like One of the... Um, one of the guys local here posted something today. Actually, was it today? It was, it was today it's talking about Golub. Oh, uh, yeah. Ken, uh, Ken Golub up here posted uh, something about the average uh, lunker over the years and how dramatically it's dropped. And it showed how the fishery is just getting more unhealthy. I mean, yeah. there's, don't get me wrong. There's giant bags early in the year that get caught out of there. But year after year, it's getting worse and worse. And it's because they, they sprayed it. Yeah, uh, I don't know how consistently they spray that lake now, but I've just seen other Finger Lakes like, and I'll just throw it right out there. I, we, Cayuga has been getting beaten the crap out of. They're, it's getting sprayed every week, and it's just, I mean, it's going to hurt the fish. Like, it, it, there's no way it doesn't affect the fish. They can say what they want. It happens. There's nowhere for the fry to hide. Exactly, it kills a freaking lake. Like, mm -hmm. it's, oh, Pete Glusick, uh, Bass University. Mm -hmm. you know, did a, an episode because he's been doing so well tournament wise recently and he mentioned literally when they were practicing for the bfl uh which a buddy of a uh, friend of ours casey smith ended up winning that they literally sprayed it during practice like the day before the tournament they were oh, literally up there spraying around boats like yeah. it's not good no no and i mean there's and you know, don't y'all have like those rollers or some lakes do and that's like i would yeah. much prefer there's that nothing there. there's nothing wrong with that like i i i mean i understand that like pleasure boaters have to be on the water like they want to get away from their dog they don't want to i understand there's nothing wrong with that but like nuking a place it's ridiculous like it's there's no point in it i'm sorry and it's all of from what i've heard it's like they get paid by so many gallons that they spray so the more they put to it the more they get paid so like, the dollar them. pushes everything yeah yeah. Well, one of my buddies, he's not very bright, but uh, he, he decided to, when they sprayed one time, he jumped in the lake where they sprayed just to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, like he started getting itchy like crazy, getting like shit on his skin. And I was oh, like, yeah. like, what Please did you tell think me was going to happen? What? Was it forest? No, no. I oh. want for his, for his own sake. <laughs> I, <don't think laughs> I was like, I can totally uh, see forest doing that. Forrest probably wouldn't do that. He's pretty dumb, but he's smart ish. Yeah. Not really. Um, but <laughs> you can't put two and two together, bud. You're either smart ish or just dumb. Hey, there there's dumb but smart at the same time. It is possible. Yeah, see, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh man. But yeah, no, it's it sucks to see that. It really does. It does it does, because I mean it'll kill like like just that quick. Yeah, and it, it's it's something that I would really like to take the time out. You know, we had Gene Gilland on here, who obviously you get to spend a lot of time mm -hmm. around uh, and talking about, you know, how do we start an, an initiative to try to at least get a seat at the table? 
Because as far as I'm concerned, in New York, I don't think anglers have a seat at the table. Oh, I'm but sure not. Do, yeah, what, it was those decisions. So yeah, uh, it's just I've just been unfortunately recently been slam packed. But once we get some open time, like it's it's on my to do. I literally have the paper sitting right here next to me. It's on my to do list of mm-hmm. you know contacting them and seeing how to even get something started. I don't think yeah. I'm the best person to sit at that table, but if I can start the process of getting someone who who is the right person to get a seat at that table? No, it's got to do what you got to do. Cause yeah, like, for sure. They're just destroying be- like amazing fisheries. Yeah. yeah it which, smells and ugh. Which brings in revenue to the cities and the towns around because, I mean, you get a really good lake. I mean, Bassmaster takes, you know, takes some – you know, LF, like everybody's just like, hey, we need to come here, and then all this money comes in. Like, I mean, it just helps everything. I just don't understand. I mean, I don't know, but. yeah, I mean, beyond well, like a, a Champlain, you know, when they came to Cayuga two years ago in August, like mid August, which is usually a really hard time of year, mm-hmm. I think it was like all top 10 was over 21 pounds. Like, yeah, they like, smashed 25. Them. Like, and the, I think it was a year prior, or maybe two years prior, when um, I think Hackney won it. Mm hmm. Like, I think he had over 21 every day. Yeah, easily. Yeah. I mean, he I think 21 with four fish. I about say on one of the days he caught four and had like almost 22. So, All right. yeah, it's it sucks to see <clears throat> what's going on. But yeah, basically, long story short, we're trying to see what we can do about that. But, um, but dude, Andrew, you got anything left for Wes here before we let him go? Enjoy the off season. <sighs> yeah, I'm going to try to. I've actually got to head up to Wisconsin next week and do a a media event with uh, the outdoor brand or whatever, the outdoor group, I think. Um, AFCO, Gamagatsu, Sunline, and all those great people. So that'd be fun. Yeah, that'd be a lot of fun, dude. Let, me know, stuff, let me know man. how it goes. Hopefully I get to catch one or two before I have to give my boat away. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, man. So you, got the, you got the new one coming in a lot earlier this year? It, it's a, it's It got ordered in June. I don't know when it'll be here. That's I don't. No, that's kind of up in the air. I think the boat will be fine. I think the the horsepower on the back might be the problem, but Uh-oh. it is what it is. You were a Mercury or Yamaha? Yamaha, Yamaha. Oh, that's and I mean, a- I I haven't heard anything, you know, about not getting one. I just know it's, you know, with the way everything is, everything's yeah. kind of backed up. Oh yeah, you run a Skeeter, right? If I remember yes, correctly, yeah. So the tenfold, you don't run a Skeeter without a Yamaha. So for sure, and I, I I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to run anything else right now, honestly. It's I've ran that's oh, I've ran it. This is the second year, and like I've had no issues, knock on wood. But it's like I just run it, and it brings me in every time. Like, and that's not a sponsorship plug. Like it literally, like I just get in it and go. Yeah, I'm interested to see how the new revamped version of the mm-hmm. show runs. Yeah, it'll be. I'm looking forward to it. It looks like a transformer. It looks like uh, what's that uh, what's that show uh. It's like a bee, it's like a bug. It's it's a it's a, a TV show. No, it's a movie. Bugs like Life. No, 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 no. It's a transformer, but it's not transformers. Like it's a bumblebee. That's oh, it. yeah. yeah he, tra- he is a transformer. <laughs> well, it's but it's not like a transformer movie. Like it, like yeah. I understand. Are you it talking trans- about like the straight bumblebee movie with John Cena? No, the new one. Like I ain't seen it. I just saw some previews. Is John no, Cena I'm- in the new one? I don't know. I thought you were just talking about like Bumblebee's movie he has by himself because that is the most god awful movie I think I've. Is it a new, like a newer one? I watched twenty minutes and turned it up. No, I think it's been around for like three or four years. I don't know. Either way, whatever this transformer is, like that's what. It, <laughs> that's what. It like. That can kind of see like the shape of the face. Yeah, like the shape yeah. of his head is like the shape of the motor. I mean, it looks it looks cool. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> We, we kind of went way off at this moment. <laughs> we went way out there on that one. <laughs> I'm gonna look at the analytics of this show, and like, it's just gonna be viewership, viewership, and it's gonna be a wall. As it's just gonna drop. That point, everyone's gone. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not, we're not West having West about back on again. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's mark West on the list of never having. <laughs> yeah, don't ask that guy again. Uh, we want to do good on the show. It's not like. <laughs> Whenever we decide to retire this show, let's have Wes on at the end. There you go. A <laughs> final so hoorah. Well. You won't have anybody else watching it. <laughs> what, one last thing I can say here, though, is if you do come through Buffalo, let us know, Wes, and we'll, we'll take you out smallmouth fishing. 
thank God I need somebody to make me feel like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's on your way I mean, home. Kind of. If you, it. if you take the 90, so. Nice. I think I've, I don't know. When I, I went up there, one, to, one of the trips I went up there, I went by Erie. I don't know where I was at. Yeah, like I, was probably, I got you. I got you. So go to Buffalo. Don't go to Sandusky Bay. No, yeah, go, go don't go Sandusky. Go don't Buffalo. go that way. I can catch some water's <laughs> mouth over there, though. You can, you can catch them here, too. But oh, well. Best of both worlds, then. Yeah. I've done, learn, I've done learn you don't go up there and worry about a green fish unless you go to Champlain. You can catch a couple, but you ain't. I mean, it's. I don't know. I feel like if you're gonna look for largemouth, like in our practice tournaments, you've got to commit. Like you've got to go look for the best area. Like you're not just gonna run around and wing and ding and catch a big one here and there. Like you got to commit to it. And I just commit smallmouth, trying to figure it out. We're gonna figure it out one day. And when I, when I figure it out, you're gonna look at you're gonna look at the results, man, and be like. He figured it out on this one. Who the hell is this guy? <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's lost. One of these yeah. times you guys go to Champlain or St. Lawrence and you come in over the, you know, you're in the top 20, top 10 with all smallies. I'm going to call you oh. and be like, all right, what the hell did you learn? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, yeah. God. Well, buddy, dude, uh, we really appreciate you taking time out tonight. It's good to get you Thank back you. on here. Let's try to uh, get you on a few more times uh, in Sounds the next good. year. Just twice, but uh, obviously we always appreciate you coming on. Always coming on, twice you, dude. in a year and a half. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> who goes with scheduling around here? Some jabroni. I don't know who. Some guy who should not be in this position. Oh, oh, like four times. I think this is only the second time, but yeah, we're sitting here like yeah, it's like three, four degrees. It's like, like October two thousand nineteen. <laughs> Oops, it's August twenty twenty one. Yeah, we're doing real. We're doing big things. Sorry, no, bud. No. <laughs> Until next time. See you in October oh, of yeah. 2022. See you next year. No <laughs> doubt. Maybe maybe we'll have another trophy by then. I hope so. Oh, That's fingers man, crossed. Right? Oh, quick question before we get you off here. What is your hat? I've been thinking, like, trying to figure out what the hell it is. This whole show. It's a new Zoom hat. That's a oh, oh yeah, Zoom day. Yeah. Man, I need a haircut. Don't look at my hair. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah, you, you. You said it. Can you see it? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. I'm it's kind of like that. I uh, thought Zoom Bates was getting sold. Just kidding. But that was like the biggest joke going around for a minute. God, Zoom don't start that. Down. Don't put don't put that out on the internet. They're definitely not being sold. They got no. more than they can they can do right now. I'm, <laughs> I was I like, there's agree. no way. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, it was just not funny. at all. No, it, it was cool. going around though, big time for sure. Oh, it's huge. I was like, what is, what are these people talking about? Is that April Fool's time frame? No, it was like. June. Yeah, that was a couple months, like two months ago at the most. People have been asking me since like February. I'm like, no, no way. Uh, you're with Zoom. I need you to get everything you can get because they're about to go out of business. I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> like, Nobody now, has not product a, right now. Breathe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hell, go on Tackle Warehouse. See if anybody's – is everybody going out of business right now? Yeah. <laughs> Literally. I mean, they might be, but if they do, we got a lot bigger problems than just <laughs> Zoom running out of worms. Yeah. yeah. That's a fact. Yeah. Well, dude, we appreciate taking time out. Obviously, uh, we want to get you back on here again soon. And uh, obviously, good luck in the off season. You know, safe Enjoy. travel to Wisconsin. And then, you know, kill a damn deer quick so you can come up the area this fall. I'll do my best. I'll do my best. But, uh, guys, appreciate you having me on. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, man. You have a good night. Yeah, you take care. We'll talk to you. See you, bud. Oh, man. Talk about tangents. It's always tangents when Wes comes on here. I say that. It's the second time on here. But I feel like I just talk with him so much that I just like, it's always tangents. We should probably change the title to the Serious Tangent Podcast. Because we just get (laughs) on rabbit holes and tangents basically every time. So. (laughs) Good gosh. No, it's always good getting Wes on, though. It's, uh. Wes has become one of a good buddy of mine in this industry, one that's uh, very genuine. You know, he's willing to, if you help him out, he helps you good out people. to feel like, yeah, very good people. So um, appreciate him taking time out tonight. We're looking to obviously get him on the show a lot more. Um, more than I thought I'd realized. I, I guess I guess I must have thought he'd been on more than I'd. I think well, we just asked him to come on. We're like, yeah, and then he kind of. 
He always just shuts us down. He's like, I'm too cool for these guys. <laughs> Scrubs. I got a blue trophy. I don't need to come out anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. You'd never do that. Uh, Andrew and I take like a, a different approach to things. Like, uh, I think what Andrew and I do is because we are very relaxed with how we run things is we don't like go after guys that, that win. Cause we, we already know that they're going to have like 30,000, whether it's, whether it's another podcast, what's a TV show, whether it's a, you know, it's a online, you know, like news deal, like it's a, you know, whatever it might be. Like, we're just like, yeah, well, you know, when things slow down, we'll get you on. We'll like try to pick apart something that, you know, the, those mainstream outlet didn't. And it's not a knock at what they're doing because I listen to the hell out of a lot of this. Yeah. Listen, watch, read, whatever it is. I mean, Andrew and I are consuming the living hell out of it, but that's cool. Cause you kind of get them out when they're relaxed and you can kind of, almost pick their mind a little bit easier which is kind of cool absolutely yeah but uh and then no, we, we get we, an hour and a half in on tangents <laughs> so it works yeah you you're an hour and 30 minutes in and wes is talking about freaking transformers bumblebee movie they thought came out yes <coughs> yesterday yeah <laughs> which is <laughs> the worst freaking movie ever because i'm so a huge bad. transformer fan uh and yeah just john cena and transformers don't mix it's still mix. Either way, a um, couple things coming up. Um, we mentioned how we we're going to get Ben Nowak on Monday as a pre-recorded. Um, it looking like schedule-wise, um, and hopefully, obviously, Hotel said they have good Wi-Fi uh, in North Dakota. Uh, if that be the case, what we're planning on doing, and obviously, you know, we'll give the ultimate decision this weekend uh, once I know a little bit more. But um, we're planning on having Ben Nowak on as Monday Night Live. And what we're going to do is we'll, we'll kick it off because I do have stuff to do Monday night work-wise. Uh, I think what we'll do is we'll start the show, Andrew and I, get Ben on, and then I'll probably have to leave like halfway through or so. Um, and then Andrew it will take over the rest, and they'll probably just pick apart some small mouse and different things. I got some ideas of stuff we can get creative with Ben. Um, either way, really excited to uh, – Or just let him run the whole show because – Yeah, we'll just bring on Ben him. and say, hey, run with it. See you later. Bye. Uh, <laughs> make sure you upload this to here and there. Here's the passwords. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. <laughs> make sure we get paid. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, excited to get Ben on. We've had Ben on a few times. Good friend of ours. And uh, hopefully we can uh, make that work for you guys for Monday Night Live. Um, as for next Friday, uh, we don't have a show made out yet. I get home literally at 11 p.m. next Thursday. Uh, so either we'll have to figure out a, a show to try to do while I'm in North Dakota, or maybe, uh, Andy and, um, and Deacon will try to film something for, for Friday. But, uh, Deacon's got a really good episode, uh, out this week. Uh, it's on the YouTube channel. It's not on the MP3. Uh, the reason it is not on our MP3 for this week is because he went to his own platform, uh, to kind of show his, uh, his listeners if they're different than ours. Uh, basically, Hey, look at this merger is going on. This is where my MP3 is going to be in the future. Um, so that being said, moving forward as of next week, um, all of Andrew's, excuse me, I'm going to do this a lot because Adam, Andrew. Just Adam, call him Deacon. Yeah. It would be easier I know. to call I, him I Deacon. Just, I've called him Deacon for a while, so I don't know why I try to refer to his first name when we're on the show. But well, Deacon's, epi <laughs> Deacon's <laughs> episodes moving forward will be on our MP3 and our YouTube uh, he had on Sean Budiak from X2 Power this past week. Great um, listen if you haven't really, listened to it yet. Very good listen. Sean's a good dude. Um, and that's on our YouTube channel. So if you guys want to check that out, we'll uh, we'll link that right here. Um, but other than that, um, there's a video out yesterday that I posted about my kayak setup for my electronics. How I'm running a Helix 9 and a, Hel and a Helix 10. Um, and look out for a video because Mega 360 is coming soon. And I'm putting that on the Hobie. Um, so we're going to have a, a pretty, pretty dope rig to be completely fair. Um, and, and for and those who tuned in in the morning, realized that the video I posted did not have sound, unfortunately. But, <laughs> Andrew um, is in his learning curve for video editing. <laughs> well, it's kind of funny because I came home and on my computer, I played it yesterday. It was fine. Today, it wasn't good. So I just literally deleted it and re-uploaded it and it's fine. That's so weird. Yeah. So I don't know what happened. Yeah. Well, either way, uh, guys, uh, Andrew is going to be helping a lot. Andrew and Deacon are really going to be helping and stepping up big time when it comes to filming and editing and putting these videos out. 
Uh, so you'll see a mix of the three of us, whether together collectively or even individually putting out some different content. Uh, make sure you guys are on there liking and, and commenting so we kind of get some feedback from what you guys want to see, how we can critique it for the better, maybe some things that we're doing well that you guys appreciate, maybe that we can expand on. Um, either way, we appreciate it all. And lastly, if you guys are watching Apple Podcasts, we do appreciate if you guys can go lead us, leave us a rating and review, uh, whether good or bad. It does not matter to us. We just appreciate your honest and goodness feedback. Um, so we appreciate that. And uh, I think Andrew, that's going to do it for us tonight. Uh, again, huge shout out to Wes Logan for joining us again. Always good to get him on. And hope you guys enjoyed it as well. As always, we appreciate you, and we'll see you on Monday.